like to welcome George Takac to, good, good. to this Friday's seminar, um, which is part of the seminar series that we organize at NIPSE. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the school. Um, George is a graduate of NIPSE. Uh, very proud of what proud grad. Yeah, proud, but we're also very proud of what he's done. Ah. It is BA at U of T, came to Nipsia, and then after Nipsia did a JD or LLB at the University of Toronto, and then was a partner at McCarthy Tetro for 35 plus years where he practiced technology law. Um, he's also been an adjunct professor in computer law for 22 years, and we met a few months ago and at the time, the, his book was in the process of being published. And I said, wouldn't it be great if we have you come back and give a talk about, about your, your latest book? So he's the author of this recent book on Cold War 2.0, Artificial Intelligence in a New Battle Between China, Russia, and America. And hence the title of, of today's talk, which is What Does the Cold War Mean for Canada? Uh, so welcome. To the school, and we look forward to hearing from you. It's my understanding that you'll speak for about 40 minutes or so, so we won't interrupt, but then we'll have a Q&A. Sure. But maybe if people have only like clarification questions, they can jump in, but otherwise nothing. I've happen. never known a Nipsey person <laughs> to have a low-key clarification question. Yeah. It's usually a major, well, let's take that in a different direction, but in a, no, yeah. sure. I mean, yeah. it's very much interesting. Okay, so over to you. Yeah, so thank you, Teddy. Delighted to be back. Uh, I must say the setting is bordering on the palatial now. Uh, we were in a different setting and it was cramped and, well, it wasn't like this, so, so lucky for you. How many of you are current students? Okay, so just to take one little riff off of my introduction, which you got perfect. Um, when I finished Nipsia, I was actually heading in my own mind for the foreign service. And then somebody whispered in my ear, you know, if you go to law school and you come into the foreign service as a lawyer, you can help negotiate treaties. And at the time, the UN... Uh, Law of the Sea Treaty was very much de rigueur. It was just being finalized, and I, I thought it was a brilliant piece of work. I'd studied it, and I wanted to work on it. So I thought that was a great idea. So I went to law school. But in my third summer of law school, I spent a summer um, at Nortel, which I noticed downstairs walking in is your biggest donor to... To Carl, and at least that chart as you walk in would have us believe. And I completely fell in love with technology. And the law firm where I was articling had a group of technology lawyers, and I just happened to be there. And, and so the rest is history. So I got detoured away from a foreign service career, though in my legal career, I worked a lot with international companies and concerns obviously a lot north-south with the U.S., fairly regularly with Europe, and then not as regularly, but quite a bit with um, really the sort of Western Pacific, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea. So to the students, I would simply say, be open to possibility. Um, you think you have a, a certain route ahead of you, uh, be open to being detoured, and this is a great time to be at the buffet and just try different stuff. And uh, the trick is to find something you're passionate about, and then it's not really worked. So there, I've discharged my um, <clears throat> alumni speech. So uh, I finished my legal career December of 2022. I turned 65, and notwithstanding legal rules about discrimination and ageism, uh, you have to leave the partnership. Uh, but it was time, because I did want to return to writing and thinking about geopolitics, but I wanted to keep my tech background and experience. So I merged the two 
And the result is um, my first book, Cold War 2.0, which has a good news, bad news flavor to it. Uh, the bad news is, I argue we're in another Cold War. I call it Cold War 2.0. And essentially, it's the juxtaposition of the democracies and the autocracies. This is a frame that the Biden administration is using. I think it's actually not a bad one. Democracies, fair and free elections, personal freedoms, rule of law, with independent judges, very, very important. And then the autocracies, none of that. And that this has rippling implications throughout the geopolitical system and the global system. If an autocrat doesn't do rule of law domestically, the chances of that autocrat doing the rules-based international order internationally is, is very small. And the implication of that um, particularly if you compare it to Cold War I, it was more the frame of capitalism versus communism. And even though we're dealing in China with the Chinese Communist Party, uh, it's the fundamental autocratic nature of the Beijing regime that I think drives the tension and the conflict. Now, <clears throat> the current Cold War, I put it as a start of 2014. It was the uh, Russian annexation of Crimea. You could easily put it to 2008 when Russia did something very similar in Georgia. But that's, I think, a quibble. Uh, 2014 is also when China begins to get very aggressive in the South China Sea. And I have a few slides on that. I found that in North America, everybody's up the curve in an audience like this with Ukraine, for sure. But South China sees a bit of a sleeper. So I want to spend some time on that. And I want to spend some time on Taiwan. Again, on the other side of the world, rather than on the European side. And it's generally for Cold War 2.0, the autocratic protagonists are Russia and China, but they've sort of switched roles um, Cold War I, as I've rebranded it, you know, for the longest time, it wasn't World War I, it was the Great War. And then when a second global conflict arose, they rechristened the Great War, World War I. So that's my, my nomenclature for calling it uh, Cold War I. Um, and while there are parallels, by the way, in the two, there are some very important differences. And the major one being that the major protagonist is actually China, not Russia. And the degree of economic interdependence between China and the democracies, it, it's not even an order of magnitude greater than Cold War I, because Cold War I, there was very little economic integration or trade, commercial, very little uh, foreign direct investment. Whereas the dynamic, of course, with China is that it remains the workshop of the world. If I went to a Walmart anywhere in Ontario, 80% you know, of the merchandise is still coming out of China. And so what are the implications of that level of integration. Uh, I don't talk about some of the supporting cast, uh, but North Korea, Venezuela, Cuba, Iran uh, have all increased in importance. Um, who'd have thought Russia would be so reliant on Iranian drones, North Korean artillery uh, ammunition? Uh, it's really quite stunning. So, but the book is primarily focused on China and Russia. I have a second book in mind called The Other Autocrats, uh, where we deal with 
these players and organized crime, which I've just been given a mini lecture on. So we're gonna talk more. Um, and there's a Canadian impact. And again, I'm assuming this crowd is up the curve. Um, I have a good friend in Sarnia, Ontario. And a few months ago, she was giving me blow by blow about that massive ransomware attack in Sarnia, Windsor, Chatham, against the healthcare system. In Toronto, you actually can't use uh, the Toronto Library because of a ransomware attack, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The bulk of that is coming from groups within Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. Now, they are sometimes state actors, the Ministry of Security. Uh, often they're private actors, but condoned, aided and abetted by the state. Uh, Putin has a deal. He'll allow uh, those groups to operate as long as they're only attacking democracies and they have to pay a certain fee to operate. And if they comply with those conditions, they can do their thing. And this is not a new phenomenon for those of you that are history buffs. Uh, Sir Francis Drake, Elizabeth I, right? Francis Drake attacking the gold galleons that the Spanish were sailing back from the New World. And again, as long as Drake didn't attack British shipping, could absolutely harass Spanish. And he was even knighted for his uh, efforts. Economic coercion, this has been the, a, a serious problem for Canada vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China in particular. Uh, we're still on the bad list for receiving Chinese tourists, which in the hospitality industry in Canada is, is a huge uh, hole in their business model, even today. Uh, but it's canola, it's various other products, and it's this fascinating economic integration point that I mentioned earlier, where you're too reliant on a trading partner, it produces sort of counterproductive economic dynamics for you. Cognitive warfare, if you're following the commission on uh, Chinese influence in our domestic uh, politics. Um, I was in Taiwan uh, three months ago for a couple of weeks on a study trip. And the cognitive warfare there is like way, way up the, the continuum. We're not there yet. But um, it's very clear when China puts its mind to it, just how significant their impact can be. I mentioned the commission, intellectual property theft. The uh, summer I worked at Nortel, they used to have um, a facility in Belleville that made printed circuit boards of a precursor of sophisticated modern semiconductor chip technology. And one of the cases I was asked to work on, there was a visiting group from China, they toured the plant, and as they left, they, they had to shake hands with the hosts. And one guy was very reluctant, but he thought, okay, I've got to shake hands because it'll be him. And as he shook hands, a printed circuit board slipped out of his, his shirt. And uh, today, of course, with the internet, you don't need to do the physical stuff. There's lots of other ways to do it. If you're following it in the globe, the Winnipeg facility, the biotech uh, vaccine and associated agent type uh, substances, um, and finally, uh, just plain old 
keeping an eye on your own territory, particularly in the north. Um, you know, there are Russian and Chinese submarines, nuclear powered, under the ice. Canadians don't have that capability. We, we have to go up on a ship and look with our binoculars. We'll talk about AUKUS uh, in a minute. So the focus of the book is global in the sense of America, Europe, and, um, and then the autocrats, but there's obviously and significantly uh, a Canadian dimension. This is the one I mentioned earlier, the South China Sea, which again, you may be up the curve on, but, but a lot of people aren't. So uh, I take a minute on it and I don't know if, if there's too much light or, or whatever, but so here's China, here's Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and then the Philippines up here. And this body of water is the South China Sea. Now, don't let the name fool you. Um, a big chunk of this, the Philippines call the West Philippines. Um, my first IR prof in undergrad at U of T, James Ayers, said often, um, what you think about the world depends on where you sit in the world. And basically, this South China Sea, I mentioned the Law of the Sea Treaty. I hope you can see this. Under the UNCLOS principles, the 12 mile territorial sea and then the 200 mile exclusive economic zone which was a new construct developed in the 70s, the early 80s, and it was the big breakthrough in the rules-based order as applied to maritime boundaries. That's the blue dash line. So China, under the rules-based international order, would get this amount of maritime territory. The first 12 miles is yours. The next 200 miles is exclusive economic zone. It's sort of yours, but it's not entirely yours. So people can do certain things within it, and especially transiting, especially you know, cargo shipment and so on. But fishing is regulated by, in this case, China up here. And of course, the big play was fossil fuels underneath the seabed and then minerals on the seabed, if you're following that technology. And then, you know, Vietnam would get a big chunk of the South China Sea, this, this blue line here. The Philippines would get, again, another big chunk, Indonesia, Malaysia. This internal, uh, which is past everyone's 200 mile economic zone, that's international waters. Well, uh, along comes China and draws a delimitation and says, everything in here is ours. 90% of the South China Sea. Well, you can imagine the uproar particularly amongst the other literal states. And the Philippines actually takes China to court. There is an international court in the Hague, the Permanent Court of Arbitration. It's referenced in the Law of the Sea Convention. And by this point, 2016, it, it's the standard way that states with conflicting claims deal with dispute resolution. Canada went through it with the US. I remember one of our litigators at McCarthy's was previously the head of litigation for the federal government, and he led the case, the maritime delimitation between Nova Scotia and Maine. Because how you draw that line, uh, if you do vector analysis and math and geometry, it, it matters a lot how you draw that line. And if you think about that part of the North Atlantic, it's fairly shallow. 
lots of drilling potential lately offshore wind for turbines and so forth. And Washington and Ottawa couldn't agree. It was submitted to the court. Uh, I heard Ian Binney, who was this lead counsel, um, talk about the case and the law and so on, but he was also a great litigator advocate and he had little tidbits. The Peruvian judge, if you had an argument for him, you always had to make that in the morning. Because he drank a little bit at lunch and he'd be half falling asleep by the afternoon and so on and so forth. So, so there's a lot of colorful stuff that goes on, but generally it works. And the decision that came down, Canada was unhappy, the US was unhappy, so it was a good decision. And they both lived with it. Chinese line. Now it's called the nine dash line because in the um, Chinese projection of it, they of course don't show what the rules-based international order requires. They just do this nine dashes. Now this one is actually the 2023 standard map. This is what school children in China are taught. They've added a 10th dash to encompass Taiwan. And Taiwan actually is portrayed simply as a province of China. This is now, I think, uh, one of the serious fronts of Cold War 2.0. Because not only are they claiming it, uh, we have a saying in the law called possession is nine tenths of the law. It helps if, if you grab something, if you want to claim legal ownership of it. So China is starting to militarize. Well, not starting now. It has been militarizing since 2016. Uh, this is a great example. This is Mischief Reef. I mean, if you wrote a novel or a screenplay, you couldn't come up with a better phrase. It was over Mischief Reef that the countries had their falling out. So imagine a place with palm trees swaying and gentle breezes and um, clearly some sort of volcanic something a few million years ago, a green paradise. And what does it look like today? Now it's a different angle, but it's a 3.1 kilometer military strength airstrip. It has radar facilities, it has barracks, it has um, basically everything you need to run a military operation. And it sits squarely um, within the Philippine economic, exclusive economic zone. It's part of the Spratly Islands right over here. Now, the current one that you may have heard about or followed is up here, Scarborough Shoal. That's the one where the Chinese are in the process of trying to build a similar military base. And the Filipinos have run aground a ship, an old ship. And, and they're, they're fighting, quote unquote, for the claim that they're making about owning that Scarborough Shoal. The Chinese Coast Guard is trying to prevent the resupply of that ship. And the Chinese Coast Guard uses these ships that would make the Navy of any other country really, really proud. They're basically Navy ships, but they're painted white. And the Philippines shows up with its much smaller truly Coast Guard ships. And they're jostling and juggling and, and jousting. Am I allowed to ask questions? When I teach at Osgood, when I used to teach at Osgood, I was very interactive. And this is actually strange for me to talk this much uninterrupted tonight. Sure. Why is this conflict between the Philippines and China so important from a global scale? Yes. First island chain? It's, it's part of the first island chain, so it's strategically important. But which country thinks that's particularly important? States. 
the United States. And what is it, last, last point to drive, you're at a B plus, <laughs> you're almost at an A. What is it about the United States and the Philippines that's particularly relevant and salient to this conflict? Yeah. Somebody else, somebody else? Maybe. Yes, yes, that would be the primary asset for contesting it. But I'm thinking of a legal relationship, a political relationship. It was a territory of the United States until around 1898, was it not? Yes, and today that territorial relationship has evolved into what? You, oh, you're so close. Defense pact? Yes, there's a mutual defense agreement between the Philippines and the United States, very similar to NATO, with Article 5. If there's an attack on the Philippines, including an attack on a Philippine Navy ship, the U.S. is, quote, obliged. I mean, they're not obliged to do anything even under Article 5, little known fact, but in any event, and so this could easily set off a major conflict between the two major protagonists. And by the way, what, why is the South China Sea so important? This map, the yellow is the high intensity route for trade. So these are the numbers of sort of sailings and you go off the scale here. Um, yeah, the Suez is important, and the Red Sea, as we're learning very much today, and the Houthis up here and so forth. But the amount of traffic through here, the, this is the South China Sea, because it feeds Southeast Asia, it feeds China, it feeds Taiwan, it feeds Japan, it feeds South Korea. And there was a time, a couple of thousand years ago, where China demanded and received tribute from all these states. And it's not a huge stretch to imagine what they would do if they could control the South China Sea. So that's the South China Sea. You'll hear more about it, I'm sure, over the coming months and years. This is the other one I wanted to spend a few minutes on, because again, Canada tends to be Atlantic, an Atlanticist in its outlook. Uh, from a security perspective, we look at NATO, we look at Europe. Uh, we have a battle group in Latvia, part of NATO. But the action with China is, is happening on the other side of the world. So here's tiny little Taiwan. And you're absolutely right, part of the first uh, island chain, which is considered, you know, Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines. The second one being Guam, which is a tiny little island here and so forth. And there's no doubt that geostrategically, the United States would like to keep a firm control block with the first island chain. And not only is Taiwan small, this is a physical map of Taiwan. All of this white stuff and gray, this is mountainous forest. So three quarters of the island is virtually uninhabited. It's beautiful. Uh, my wife and I, we sort of drove through parts of the mountains. It's, it's, it's gorgeous. But no economic or urban activity goes on here. So everything is in this sliver of green, and even Taipei, the capital, it's surrounded by mountains. You don't really get into the plains until you get down here. And this has, again, very significant geostrategic implications. When we talk about a potential blockade of Taiwan by China, they don't actually have to worry about the west side, or sorry, the east side of the island. Um, and you won't see any amphibious landings on the east side of the island. All the action would be on the west side. And this, the Taiwan Strait, is only 160 kilometers. So in fact, the Chinese could enforce a blockade 
with just missiles and batteries on their coast. Uh, a lot of security thinkers, when they hear blockade, they think of the Cuban Missile Crisis, where you, you put a ring of naval vessels around an island. That's not what would happen here. The Chinese would mine these ports. These are the key ports. And anything trying to come in the last few kilometers would be the kill zone with missiles. And basically, it would be a real knife fight at very close quarters. Now, on this tiny little strip, the Taiwanese have created an economic juggernaut. 50% of Taiwan's GDP is technology, which like nobody else is even close. It, it's an astounding percentage. And within that, semiconductor chips, which basically power anything in our economy that has an on-off button and that runs on electricity, it has one, or in the case of an iPhone, you know, 37 important semiconductor chips. And the leading company in the world for that is the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, we call it TSMC. And the bulk of its facilities are in Taiwan. Uh, if you've been to Silicon Valley in California, it's sort of like, this is San Francisco and this is Palo Alto. It's about one hour by a very fast sort of bullet train. And this is the Sinchu Science Park. And this is where TSMC is headquartered. And it's, it's an amazing facility. Um, the one I'm gonna show you is actually one of their campuses down here in Hainan. It's a series of buildings, clusters of buildings. Each one of these is like six stories tall, like four football fields wide, five football fields long. They send half completed products from one building to another with these sort of covered conveyor belts. And this is where 92% of the most powerful computer chips in the world are made in this facility and the others that the TSMC has in Taiwan. Now, you've probably heard their TSMC is building a facility in Arizona to placate the Americans, but it's not going to be the most advanced chips. Uh, they're building one in Germany for even older chips for the automobile sector, and they're building one in Japan, but again, not the leading edge. The, the real McCoy is happening in Taiwan. So if you buy into the conceptual analogy that information and artificial intelligence is the new oil, Taiwan is Saudi Arabia. And so it's strategically critical beyond these factors, this is why I went to Taiwan. I, I, I got to know, in writing this book, I got to know Taiwan for its strategic nature. But I said, what, what's really going on there? Well, it turns out it's an amazingly vigorous democracy. It puts us to shame. It's actually ranked ahead of us in the rankings. It ranks ahead of the Germans, the French, the British, let alone the US. That produces an amazingly vibrant civil society. Uh, again, on a par with Canada, all the associations, the clubs, the lions, the, you know, the rotary, the service groups and so on, heavy on personal freedoms. Uh, rule of law, it was actually a judicial decision that brought in uh, gender equality, same-sex marriage, same-sex adoption. They have the largest pride parade, uh, gay community in Asia. 
It's a relatively clean government, very little corruption actually at the federal level, some at the municipal level. Their healthcare system looks a lot like ours. They have 173 universities and colleges, particularly strong in STEM, as you might expect it to feed the tech beast. And all of this drives the Chinese crazy. Because since 1949, when the Communist Party in China came to power, they've convinced most of the population that democracy is not appropriate for a Han Chinese majority country, that Confucian values are much more important, and the authoritarian construct of Confucianism uh, is a legitimate and viable system. And don't look at the democracy model because that's not for us. And instead, um, what they're seeing is that on their doorstep, here's China, here's little Taiwan. On their doorstep is a thriving democracy with a standard of living higher than China's. And no autocrat can countenance that. And that's the driver of Cold War 2.0. I actually think it's the primary driver of Putin in Ukraine as well. He couches it in terms of rebuilding the Soviet empire and so on. I think fundamentally, uh, like Xi Jinping, Putin is very nervous about Russians looking at Ukraine and saying, well, hey, they, they live as well as us and increasingly better than us, and they get to decide who their leaders are. Uh, remember, in a democracy, the people own the government. In autocracy, the government owns the people. So this list of what makes Taiwan tick is very problematic. And <clears throat> you may recall when Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan in August 2022, uh, these are the so-called gray zone tactics. They fought the Chinese fired missiles all around the island. Essentially for four or five days, it, it was under a blockade for all intents and purposes. And then the democracy that I referred to, we saw it um, beautifully executed in January, just a month and a bit ago, when they had their presidential elections and legislative elections. Three candidates for the presidency on election night, two of them conceded graciously to the winner. Donald Trump, are you listening? There, there's a way to do this, and Taiwan is doing it. Beautiful. So the question then becomes, who will stand with Taiwan if the Chinese move against it? There is no mutual uh, military defense treaty between Taiwan and the United States for political reasons. When China opened up, they said, well, if you're going to do trade with us, you have to recognize us and you have to unrecognize Taiwan. So Taiwan is actually, uh, they've been ostracized in the international, they're, they're not even in the UN, they're kicked out of the UN. Um, but the US, especially Biden has on um, three or four occasions said, we, we will be there. And not just supplying weapons, but we will have naval ships from the US um, Seventh Fleet and, and another fleet um, there to help Taiwan. I also think Japan will be in the mix. 58,000 American troops are on Okinawa, which is only about 100 kilometers north of Taiwan. Um, the Okinawa base will be a target for Chinese um, missile fires and thousands of Japanese civilians will die very quickly in that part of the conflict. 
Uh, so I think Japan is in. I think Australia is in. Uh, they tend to follow the Americans very closely, just like the British do, because they're very exposed. And if fighting to support Taiwan is the cost of entry, they're probably there. I don't think South Korea will be in. They've got their own problems uh, and challenges with North Korea. And if China moves against Taiwan, that would be a moment for North Korea to start something on the Korean Peninsula. And I think the Koreans will say, well, that's what we're worried about. Um, I'll ask a rhetorical question, because we don't have the time right now, but in Q&A, would Canada respond? How would Canada respond? So that's the problem set. What I argue in the book is that these four technologies, artificial intelligence, semiconductor chips, quantum computing, which is sort of the next type of computing, not just next generation, and biotech are going to have disproportionate roles in the unfolding of Cold War 2.0, and hence the 2.0, the dot O is the tech reference. A couple of things about these technologies. They're what we call extreme dual use. There's a fusion of civilian and military technology. Uh, some of the missiles that Russia is now building because the sanctions have cut off chips, they're using chips from washing machines. Because with a little bit of reprogramming, they can be used for that purpose. And what I do in the book, and, and I'll pass this around, is I wanted to, well, why I wrote, why and how I started to write and think about the book is after Russia annexed Ukraine, I was startled by how tepid the response of the democracies was, particularly because I thought, you know, we have way better tech than they do. Like, you know, we can take these guys. Like, well, what, why are we holding back? And what I do in the book is I go through each of these uh, domains, and then in a separate chapter, I go through another cluster of technologies, not in the same detail, but sort of here they are. And basically, I say, who are the companies doing these technologies? What's their market cap? So how much financing have they raised, either in private markets? So the venture cap market initially, private equity is the next phase, and then public capital markets. So that's the so-called market cap on the right side, and then revenues. What sales do they have? <clears throat> now, this is the one for chips, and I do it in the others as well. Now, I'm going to get a lot of blowback on this from academics. Um, there's a, a tradition of using as your metric for this analysis um, scientific papers. There's a recent, not a recent, but a year old study out of Australia that says, you know, China's ahead of the West on 16 of 19 technologies because look at all the papers they've got. Their scientists are producing much more scholarly work and uh, they're way ahead of us. There's another school of thought that says, actually a better metric is patents. You should look at patents. And the metric I use is indicative of my 35 years in the private sector where at the end of the day, Papers are interesting, patents are interesting, but does the marketplace think your product's worth paying for? That's the gold standard. And or do investors think you're worth investing in? So we can have a reasonable discussion about my choice versus others. But bottom line, if you look at my metric, the U.S. alone is ahead of China. And if you include 
Japan, South Korea, Germany, France, the UK, Canada, Australia, the Netherlands. The Netherlands actually makes the most important chip manufacturing machine. TSMC uses that machine and makes the chips, but without this machine, there are no chips being made at that most powerful process level. And it's a fascinating story how this machine got made. The company's called ASML, and they work very closely with TSMC, and it took them 20 years, and they did stuff that nobody thought could be done. And the Chinese have tried to replicate this, and they can. So that's how I got to where I got to in terms of you know, the technology framework for the, the confrontation. And the good news is it isn't luck or happenstance that the democracies are where they are in these tables. I argue, I think persuasively, but again, Debate is a good thing. That the democracies beat the autocracies at innovation and that it's a structural reason. You need open market, multi-party players. You need a phenomenon called competitive displacement. And without it, you, you don't get new products and new technologies and new innovation flowing in a robust manner. And in autocracies, what happens is some enabler who's in charge of some technology captures the ear of the autocrat and they shut down everything else. And I talk about it in the context of Cold War I, which is what saw this phenomenon for the first time. And it's being repeated, thankfully, which would in Cold War 2.0 as well. Now, the other thing that we do, much better than the autocracies, is we have multiple bets. If you look at, for instance, the fusion section, we have you know 14 companies racing to solve the fusion problem. The Chinese have won. And, you, and it, it happens over and over and over. They're putting all their eggs in one basket. We fund 12, 15. And just by the law of numbers, your odds go way up when you've got 12 or 15. Gender equality. The number two chip company in the world, AMD, is run by a woman. President of Taiwan actually is a woman. Um, <laughs> It could be better, it, particularly in the tech industry. Uh, the former president of IBM is a woman. The current president was born in India. President of Google, president of Microsoft, born in India. It's the president of NVIDIA, which is the leading chip company in the world right now because its chips designed in California, made by TSMC in Taiwan, are particularly appropriate for artificial intelligence. Benson Wong, born in Taiwan. So we do gender equality, we do social diversity. Tim Cook, president of Apple, which for my money is actually probably the leading tech company in the world, he's gay. Immigration, I mentioned. So on all these metrics, we're much stronger. We, the democracies are much stronger than the autocrats, but you have to operationalize your strength. So the book goes on to talk about other assets, particularly alliances. And again, I think it's a structural problem. Autocrats who aren't used to constraints domestically, who aren't used to the rule of law, who, who don't need to work with anybody else, because they just run their own show, they don't do alliances well at all. 
Democracies, by contrast, you have to build consensus. You have to bring people along. You, you convince people through discussion and so forth. We're really good at alliances. And I talk in the book about AUKUS, which is a very powerful alliance between the Australians, the Americans, British. Russia and China tried one for aircraft. Uh, Russia was going to bring its jet engine technology. Chinese didn't have that. That alliance fell apart. And if you read the details of why it fell apart, just intense mistrust between these two powers that, what was the phrase? Their friendship knows no limits. It certainly does know some limits. Uh, and we saw it. And then even the aircraft the Chinese ended up building, just the C-919, the Russian piece got dropped. Uh, they build the fuselage, they build the wings, they assemble the final plane. And this was going to be their entry to avoid having to always buy Boeing and Airbus planes. The engines, they come from the US and France. The avionics, they come from a democracy. And there's about 12 other tech components that come from, from the West. So I'm almost done here. Um, this one's a hot button item for me. It's one thing to invent all this tech, both for your economic power, because you need your tax base and your economic base to fund your, your security, but also for military. It's another to actually build units of it. Uh, I'm in love probably getting the feel I'm in love with Taiwan. I'm also in love with South Korea. The Poles, the Polish government has put in orders for 40 billion, roughly $40 billion of new military equipment. Half of it's being built in South Korea. Astounding figure, an astounding development. Why? Because South Korea has done for military equipment what they did in the auto industry. You look at Kia and Hyundai, it's not Mercedes, it's not BMW, but it's 60%, 70% of those at 40% of the cost. And if you need an armored personnel carrier in a hurry, you now go to South Korea. You, you, you actually don't even come to Canada and we make pretty good armored personnel carriers. And this is why, by the way, Trump is totally wrong about isolationism. And hopefully, well, be careful where I put my hopefully. If he gets in, hopefully at that point, he will be educated again about this and, and still believe in alliances to some extent, but remains to be seen. Um, and then I spend uh, a couple of chapters in the book talking about things that we need to do better. <laughs> I have to talk about reforming the United Nations Security Council. What happens when one of the veto holders actually is the cause of the aggression, which is the worst form of violation of the rules-based international order? I'd like to see an extension of NATO to GATO, a global alliance treaty organization. Bring in the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Australians, the Filipinos, if you look at the Western Pacific, they don't have a NATO. They tried a CETO years ago, but it didn't really go very far. Instead, the US has hub and spoke relationships with South Korea, with Japan separately, with the Philippines separately, with Australia separately, with Thailand separately. And as we're finding out now, the huge problem with that is that if the Americans pull out, uh, you know, Australia and Philippines, they don't have any glue anymore. So that's second best. If, if we can't do a global GATO, at least do a PATO, which is a Pacific Alliance Street Organization. Sanctions, any of you still looking for some good thesis topics? Uh, this is a huge area. We need to do better 
in ensuring that our tech from the democracies doesn't end up with the autocrats. And it's hard. And I think there's room here for use of AI to help anti-evasion tactics and that sort of thing. I think we need to get more muscular on how to respond to cyber attacks. It's another little controversial paragraph in the book. At a certain point, uh, NATO should shut down the internet in Russia for 20 minutes. We should tell them we're doing it. We should even tell them the day we're doing it. And if you go onto the NATO website and you really drill far down into the bowels of their materials, you'll see we've done this a few times here and there, very selectively. And, and I, again, I think there's, a, there's an MA thesis in there just waiting to be written. Um, we need to strengthen democracies. I won't get into defense spending, but you know, 2% made sense when it was just 2014 and the annexation of Crimea. After 2022, it's probably closer to two and a half, maybe 3%. Poland is going for three, three and a half. Um, I was talking to the German, the number two German diplomat in Ottawa at the German embassy, and she said, you know, why are we putting another 100 billion euros into defense? Because Ukraine looks very different when you're sitting in Berlin versus sitting in Ottawa. But like our North and, and NORAD modernization, you know, everybody's focused on what happens if Trump, if he gets into the White House again, you know, pulls out of NATO. What if he pulls out of NORAD? What if he looks at Ottawa and says, uh, you're at 1.3, that's not gonna cut it. And the Americans have a thing called Northcom. They're probably fine. They're, they, they've got things covered. Uh, we're the ones who rely on them. And we may end up in a very, very exposed position. At the same time, you know, the democracies have to stop getting into wars that they shouldn't be in. Uh, Iraq was a big mistake. Bush wanted to make Iraq into a South Korea. I kind of get it, but, you know, the distance between strategy and implementation was, was huge there. Should, should never have happened and the circumstances around it and so on. Um, with all due respect to anybody in the audience who's ex-military or current military, it was appropriate in Afghanistan to go in and terminate Al-Qaeda. And then that was it, trying to create, again, a democracy in Afghanistan. That's really hard. And then what you're gonna see in the world generally is a decoupling technologically. So there'll be a, a China-Russia version of everything to do with technology, and there'll be a democracy version. And I don't want to sound like a five-year-old, but the Chinese actually started this. If you're in China, you cannot get most of the socials that you get in the States, whether that's Amazon, Google, Facebook. So, so they already started the decoupling. I'm waiting to see what's going to happen with TikTok. Uh, another fault line is going to be electronic vehicles, electric vehicles from China. Because the thing about cars and, and everything now, the cars have gone from being mechanical devices to computers on wheels. And the cars generate huge reams of personal data, driving data, entertainment data, and so on. And it all goes back to the manufacturer. And if you buy a Chinese EV, as they are buying them in droves in Europe, that data is all going back to Beijing. And when you talk about you know, cognitive warfare and so on, it's very sophisticated now and it's targeted to individuals. 
and that information is used for that sort of thing. So you're gonna, I think, see a split in the world. The low level non-tech stuff, the 80% that you see in Walmart on the merchandise shelves and so on, that's fine. You'll still be buying shower curtains in China. But the technology has to uh, be treated differently. Um, oh, and then on the strengthening of the democracies, this is the most um, threatening picture I could find quickly <laughs> from Donald Trump. I finished the book by saying that actually the most important security risk geopolitically for the work for the democracies is not China, it's not Russia, it's this guy. And it's fascinating, you know, people who, well, what's he really going to do? Well, he's telling us, you know, Hitler told us, told the democracies in a book, Mein Kampf. Like when you read Mein Kampf, everything that happened 15, 20 years later, it's all there. There was no sort of reveal in 1941. And it's astounding, not just that we have a Trump in the States, but that we have 40, 50 million people. I think that's cool. Though I got to tell you, I was listening to a Steve Pakin podcast the other day. And he had three people on who were reporting surveys and and polls that one in five American youth between the ages of 20 and 30 think that an authoritarian solution to politics is preferred over democracy. One in five. Yikes. Yikes. Okay. Um, oh, and all of these have analogs in Canada, you know, the economy matters, trade matters. Like for us, for small democracy, relatively small democracies, the rules-based international order is huge. You know, we trade far more of our GDP than the Americans do. Um, if Trump gets really, really serious with us this time, I used to do a lot of work for one of the big car companies, and one of them has a huge assembly plant in southern Ontario. And if Trump says, no more North American trade agreement, those car plants are moving to Kentucky. The big parts companies that supply those two big assembly plants, they're moving to Kentucky. Like Canada exists economically in our prosperity that pays for these palatial settings. <laughs> Teddy, I'm really not bitter about it. I, I just, I'm not, I'm over it. Oh man, you got windows and everything. Anyway, um, Trump can totally, like in four years, now I know there's a Team Canada and we go down and we lobby the governor of Michigan and so on and so forth. This guy, the previous, he, he doesn't care. About that. And frankly, at a certain point, if you're running investment decisions globally and you're sitting in Tokyo and you have this risk of market access, if my plant's in Ontario and I don't have that if it's in Kentucky, I'm gone. And Canada goes right back to viewers of wood, drawers of water. You studied Harold Innes, you know the routine. So all of this is, is hugely relevant for us. Alliances matter. So what I do at the end of this presentation, I'll just uh, mention it, is I have a little to-do list for the politicians, the diplomats, for soldiers. By the way, for the Canadian Armed Forces, this is what keeps me awake at night. As the military goes from an analog world and mechanical world to digital, so a tank becomes just a computer on wheels, but on tracks, 
this transition is incredibly hard. I used to help banks and auto companies and hospitals and so on do this transition. And it is painful. And for every arrive can and federal payment system and so on screw up that you read about, there's actually dozens of them in the private sector as well. We just don't hear about them. They hide them under the carpet. 50 million laws, 100 million laws, 200 million laws. So when people in the Hill Times and so on say, oh, you know, government doesn't know how to do this. Nobody knows how to do this. It's incredibly hard. And the biggest fear I have for the Canadian military is that the people that you need to be training and then doing this are not 66 year olds, with all due respect to anybody who's even close to that age. It's 25 to 35, you need native, digital, et cetera. And the number two in the military, a couple of months ago, said, you know, we're 15,000 short on recruitment on a military of what, 67,000? Like it's, it's an astounding deficiency. And the bulk of that 15,000 is presumably going to be helping with this. So the solution will be, well, we just piggyback on whatever the Americans are doing. And the danger in that is our stuff, our intellectual and, well, and more than intellectual property, but our, our very data and so on, will all be down in the States. You get a Donald Trump. Oh, the Russians are doing something in your North. Well, <clears throat> My protection racket printout says you haven't paid up and uh, if you want access to it, uh, da, 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 da. like, so we have in Canada a real issue, both on the military, the hard military side, but also the back office in terms of uh, AI, digital tech companies have an agenda, other companies have an agenda. Investors, this one's very interesting actually. You know, you look for surrogates. What does the private sector think about Taiwan? Warren Buffett, the world's leading investor, Berkshire Hathaway. He does hold and grow, like buy and hold. He bought TSMC in the summer of 2022, sold it like three, four months later, indeed at a loss. And his bottom line was, well, I love the company. I don't like where it is. Like if that's not an early warning sign for geopolitical risk analysis on Taiwan, I, I don't know what is. Banks have issues, lawyers have issues, and that's it. So, probably way over time, but let's get into some chit chat. Hey, uh, thanks for the presentation. It was really compelling. Uh, thanks for coming to chat with us today. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm a first year UT student. I'm in the health displacement and humanitarian policy stream. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a lot to say. Definitely, I thought a lot about, about your presentation. Um, I guess the first thing is, like, I'm not convinced of Chinese belligerence. Um, I think that they use a lot of soft power, um, and I think that they've been quite, like, like their, their like, level of diplomacy is quite good, their level of engagement, they're integrating countries with, like, economic um, hacks and stuff. Um, you know, they haven't invaded a country since well, Vietnam in the late 70s. I don't know, know the last time they dropped a bomb. Um, whereas like the U S has like between 800 and a thousand overseas military bases, they've, you know, um, kind of contradicted this rules-based international order that, that you've been talking about the whole presentation, like continually, uh, in, in my opinion. Um, and I, I think that the whole rules-based international order, like the, the legitimacy of that is kind of in shambles, especially given like Biden's funding and complicity in the, the Palestine, the, the, the genocide in, in Um, so, I mean, I, I'd like your comment about that as well. Um, also, I feel like U.S. messaging towards Taiwan has been really wishy-washy. Some of, like, Clinton's statements, Nancy Pelosi going there. Like, can they even at this point extend themselves, overextend themselves to the point where, like, if China were to do something, um, is that even feasible, given all the domestic issues at home, right. given the fact they can barely even, like, um, you know, keep up munitions to Ukraine right, right now, which is losing the war to Russia? 
um, which has been a hard pill to swallow for a lot of the, the war hawks um, in, in the US. Um, I don't know what else did I want to say. Um, also, in terms of like decoupling, you know, like China finances like an, almost a trillion or like I think nine hundred billion dollars worth of like U.S. debt. So like 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 what does that look like as well? You know, if if things were to like get even worse, um, I think that like the era of globalization we're in, like the inherent like interdependency on one another, like I think uh, you know China has a lot of of, of advantages. You talked about Walmart and stuff. You know, like yeah, like. China is 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 the factory of the world, but especially for the U.S. So, what if they kind of just, you know, re re refused that? I, I think that Russia's invasion of NATO kind of like revived NATO um, from from what was like reigning waning relevance. You know, like Macron said in 2019 that NATO was brain dead. Yes, um, th that's obviously changed a lot with with Putin's illegal and brutal invasion of of, of Ukraine. Um, but yeah, we've seen Russia kind of go into the arms of China. A lot of critics think that like. We should be welcoming Russia more into the into the fray um, to isolate China more instead of what we're doing, which is like kind of uniting them um, through through aggression, through the expansion of NATO, through a lot of things. I, I disagree with that on a fundamental level. I think that like Finland joining most recently added like what thirteen hundred kilometers of, of of like prime real estate between like Finland and Russia. Like I just don't think that makes us more safe by like adding that much more extra territory where Article Five could be. Could possibly be um, um, acted upon. Anyway, so th th those are just like some of the thoughts that I had from from your presentation. Thanks again um, for for taking the time to come talk to us today. Well, I counted, I think, eight particular points, and each one of those is probably a 20, 30 minute discussion minimum. Yeah. Um, and those of you, again, you don't have your term paper chosen. Speak to Josh. Is it Josh? Josh yeah. Speak to Josh because, like, he just set out the research agenda for sure. And all those points are are being made and um, have some scholarly and empirical stuff behind them. So, you know, nobody knows precise answer yet. Um, I have views on that, and maybe after uh, my train back to Toronto is until. Five something. So yeah, well, we can have a chat. I'll be, I'll be sitting around. To do that. Yes. Um, my name is Salomia. I'm also a student here at NIPSIA. I'm in the uh, international organizations and global public public policy stream. And I guess what I, what I wanted to touch on, what, what I wanted to get your thoughts on, you made a lot of excellent points about um, about economic coercion, about um, about, of course, military threats and military exercises, about uh, cyber threats. Uh, this uh, I'm, Part of my research currently is focusing on hybrid warfare mm -hmm. and specifically how Russia um, executed hybrid warfare against Ukraine leading up to 2014 and also especially between 2014 and 2022, which is arguably not even a hybrid war, but an all-out war, just with, you know, um, this is the little green man. Yeah, precisely, mm -hmm. little green man, and um, taking um, occupying territories in the Donbass that were very rich in resources, of course, that really uh, had an impact on Ukraine's economy. Right. And I'm curious also um, about the information space because what Russia did in Ukraine leading up to 2014 was to so was to not only get involved in Ukraine's politics pretty heavily, but also so disinformation among its society. And what I'm seeing right now in uh, in the West more generally is is troubling because I'm seeing many of the many similar trends to what they did in Ukraine leading up to their military aggression. So when you have, um, for example, in the states, you have this this large populist Republican movement that's that's actually threatening to put Trump in power again, and then you have a lot of populist movements in Europe, a lot of isolation and isolation isn't going on. And I'm wondering what your how do you think, and is it possible to to turn the tide of of these populistic movements in Western states, in the Western democratic allied states that are threatening to um, fragment Western alliances, the Western alliances right. of NATO, such as right. Norin as well, and um, and how do you think? Do you think it's possible to to get this done given 
how much of these pop, how much these populist movements are being driven by uh, disinformation through social media, through direct Russian sponsorship of um, populist candidates in, uh, in various countries. A ninth MA thesis, um, and maybe even a separate stream for next year. When I was here in 79, 80, there were three streams. There's been stream inflation, there were eight. <laughs> stream inflation, <laughs> expansion. Oh, expansion. <laughs> okay, got it. Um, so overlaid on all of that is, and I liked your phrase, the information space. And just very quickly, a couple of random thoughts. <clears throat> So my wife is actually my toughest critic. Josh, you thought you took a good chunk out of me? <laughs> my wife and my mother-in-law who was born in China. Boy, I, I get way worse than, than what you dished out. But uh, the latest one that we're uh, noodling about is survey results done in Russia. And my argument is that in, a, in the current Russia, if a pollster calls you on the phone or, or even asks you online, you know, do you support special opera, you know, military operation? It's counterintuitive to think that most people would answer that question other than by saying, you know, yes, I support it. To your narrower point about disinformation, I'll just put the corollary to that, yes, we have a lot of that going on, but Zelensky's use of the information space, on the other hand, I think has been nothing short of brilliant. And how until the Middle East you know, became engulfed in October, um, he was almost single-handedly you know, keeping alive support for Ukraine, Ukraine and a lot of that coming over his own feeds and his own video. And then a lot of the open source material that we're seeing in the West over Bucha and so forth. Um, so if there's any good news, it's that you should be able to counter the disinformation with the same sort of tools to a certain extent. And I'd encourage you to look at, if you haven't already, and you probably have by the sound of it, um, look at what Taiwan's been doing with this information. They have a trans digital minister, uh, Audrey, who is, her second name leaves me. I think it's Yang. Yang or Yang, Yang. Audrey Yang. Um, she fights rumor with humor. And it's fascinating because the fact checkers can't work fast enough. So she's come up with some fascinating approaches to disinformation and touch wood, it seems to be working. The other country I'd encourage you to look at is Estonia. The small Baltic states are huge recipients of Russian disinformation. And then the last thing I'd say is the level of sophistication of the disinformation campaigns are again astounding. So it used to be, you know, just like the old, you know, phishing, you know, it was just so obvious and there were typos and so on. Read the Mueller report again, if you haven't, going back to 2016. The, the, the internet group that Prigozhin ironically ran, they'd, they'd have someone join a Facebook group in the States. And for six months, it was just Josh or George, Teddy, they just, and then slowly in the seven months, some commentary would start to come from that person. But by now, everybody just treated him like, oh, you're part of the crowd, and da, da, da. And then slowly they turn up the dial and become a little more extremist. And, and eventually it ended with a break off to a new Facebook group of the more now radicalized, as it were. Uh, and they would take half of the Facebook group with them. So, so the, the, the techniques are very, very sophisticated. And what's fascinating on that whole set of questions is the non-state actors, right? This is, this is Facebook. So 
it, it's it's Amazon, it's um, it's Elon Musk for Starlink, which is more the pipes. But um, you know, we've never seen a conflict where so much of the information flow is happening through private sector players who, particularly in the US, uh, you know, are not beholden to government and Musk is allowed to buy Twitter. Like, hello, where was the antitrust law on that one? Um, whereas Bezos, when he bought the Washington Post, at least set up so far, touch wood, editorial separation. So those are just some thoughts, but you're absolutely bang on to be thinking about it because some of the numbers, particularly coming out of Russia, you know, 70, 80 percent support, um, you know, leads to another question. I raise it in the book, and again, I'll be shot all over the place, but we don't know exactly how many left in February, March, you know, the cream of the Western oriented communities in Russia, should we have allowed those people to come to the democracies? There's a difficult question. On the one hand, you know, your humanitarian side says, well, of course. On the other hand, the people who are going to lead those demonstrations in another color revolution and so on, they've all gone. And so what you get it is even more radicalization towards hard line. You know, what do we do about that? It also hasn't been very much vocalization from those people in the West, yeah. despite their behavior, which I find concerning. Um, I I guess like also where my where my thoughts were going, and I, I want to give other people the opportunity to ask questions as well, but I just wanted to quickly touch on what's happening in uh, the EU with the farmer protests, mm -hmm. particularly in Poland. What troubles me is that Poland is blocking not only Ukraine's borders now, but also um, Lithuanians. And what I'm seeing happening there is that um, that Russia has managed to really sway that contingent to to basically act in ways that go against their own country's security interests, um, particularly if you consider that Poland is importing a lot of Russian products and through Belarus, and those borders are free and open. Mm. Um, and also, if you look at the way that, Nash that, that Putin has been threatening um, the Baltics, I find that whole situation to be quite concerning and, and uh, revealing of the extent to which Russia can sway uh, citizens in EU countries, particularly EU, EU countries that are close to its borders. And um, my concern would be that this could lead to more um, uh, more populist autocratic regimes being elected in places like Germany, France, and other nearby states. Can I ask you a quick question? I just, just oh, want a little more respond thought, to that. Because yeah. farmers protest. Um, so don't take me too seriously about these palatial things that you have. I, I do my best writing in Sicily, actually. I spend six weeks in the fall in Sicily and da -da -da -da, in an Airbnb. I'm in a cafe in Sicily. The waiter, just a regular guy, da -da -da, we get chatting. He finds out I'm Canadian. The minute I say I'm Canadian, he goes, oh, the convoy. <laughs> And I'm in Malta two weeks ago, which is where I also do some writing. Same thing. I'm in a cafe. Da, da, da. Oh, you're Canadian. The convoy. There are streams of information now globally that, I, mean, I don't know about you, I'm sure not plugged into them. And I try to kind of go broadly over the internet, da, 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 but it's a fascinating world and they're not reading the New York Times. I'm pretty sure they're reading other stuff and we don't, you know, telegram channels and so on. And, and I honestly don't know how you speak to that waiter in Sicily or Malta about Canada because the usual channels aren't, aren't capturing their imagination. Sorry. To, well, I just have a question because in academics tend to resist speculating about things. So we encourage students to look at the past and then 
analyze what's happened. I think one of the dangers I can see with your book is that I'm not saying you're guessing, but you you are in a way assuming that the current systems will stay where they are. So I'm wondering whether you had thought about you know regime change in China or Russia. Maybe I mean things don't stay the same way. So if you look at a really long term, but there were governments in Europe not so long ago, right? That were very different from what they are today. Yeah. Right? So um, I guess that's the, the question I have is because technology can also change the way people look at their government. So there's a positive element to this. But I don't think we, like if you, yeah, yeah. maybe 20 years from now, we're going to look at this and say. So what yeah. I do talk about in the book is the internal use of AI and these other technologies <laughs> for human suppression. And especially China has built a technological infrastructure that tracks and surveils individuals. There's a social credit system. They now use facial recognition in classrooms with you know, 12 and 13 year olds. And when they're talking about Xi Jinping thought, which is the leader's philosophy, if little Johnny or Sally, apologies for not using Chinese first names, if they're not suitably engaged, the system tracks that, flags it, the parents are called in, and so it's not just Xinjiang and the Uyghurs. This is now across the spectrum. And what's incredibly disheartening is that they've exported this technology and variations of it to 60 other countries in the global south, typically autocracies. So the clamping down on civil society uh, Stalin had nothing on these people. It, it's truly astounding. So at the end, spoiler alert, um, you know, how does the Cold War 2.0 end? Uh, I talk about the prospects for regime change. And frankly, uh, I think they're less than before. The Cubans, they've sent out of the country in the last two years, 500,000 people out of a population of 10 million. So anybody who's raised any of the kinds of issues that, sorry, what's your name? Yeah. Any issues that Sonia just raised, they're on a boat to Hawaii, or not Hawaii, to uh, Miami. Um, so the techniques, like my own background is East European, it's Hungarian, and my parents and grandparents would tell me stories about you know, those Samis dot press and the jokes and the so on and so forth. There's very little of that. I, you can actually correlate humor in a society with the, the, the ability to predict some form of satirically based pushback. Uh, even Egypt, you know, the, all the stand up comics have left. It's really, really tough to. Yes. Uh, just to pick up, my name is Mitchell. I'm in the diplomacy and foreign policy stream first year uh, here at NIPSIA. Um, just to pick up on what you're saying about facial technology, would it not also stand to reason that TikTok itself, by giving access to one's camera, has exported it to the United States and the West already? Um, so that would be my, that's just sort yes. of by the by. Um, and well, or the ads on TikTok. Yeah. They're very different in the States than they are in China. And, and they're not even subtle in many cases. Yes. And so this kind of is like a, a more particular point of my my bigger question, which was just going to ask um, if you had read or consulted um, Unrestricted Warfare, the book written by two PLA colonels in the 1990s about how one would go to war between China and the United States and win. Um, and so essentially the thesis was um, you wouldn't fight the United States because that's absurd. Instead, what you would do is simply... Um, undermine the society however possible um, through things like disinformation or TikTok, um, you know, potentially um, subsidizing American debt 
for instance, as a financial instrument. And so not only do you keep the exchange rate pegged uh, for the renminbi, but then you plow all the profits back into U.S. Treasury bonds in order to um, subsidize American purchasing power to make the industrialization accelerate in order to sort of attract an industrial capacity until such time as you could confront the United States militarily. Um, side effect, for instance, the fentanyl crisis being manufactured in China and simply sent to America and saying, well, we don't know where this comes from. And so at every turn, you're well, able you have to talk to this gentleman about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And so my point being that, like, um, it's it's an interesting source, unrestricted warfare, um, as sort of a strategic blueprint uh, post Tiananmen Square era um, to understand maybe thinking in the administration in China. Um, so I just wondered. Yeah, I've only read excerpts. I haven't kind of read the thing cover to cover. But again, to the point earlier that they actually are somewhat transparent about some of the tactics that, that they may well be using. And um, you know, it, it democracy in a in a funny way sows its own seeds of potentially destruction, but at least difficulty. Um, and again, you don't need to look further than Trump to see, frankly, many of the same, you know, trends that that you've participated, that, that you've mentioned. Um, I have a section called, you know, the autocrats among us and the enablers. Um, there is a group in Russia that enables Putin, but like when a Navalny dies, it, it's not just to take out Navalny, it's the messaging effect. When uh, last month, the helicopter pilot that defected from Russia to Ukraine, and he's in Spain, there are a dozen ways the Russians could have murdered him. The way they chose, and I don't think it's happenstance, was in an open setting, it was a drive-by, five shots, one in the heart, one in the head, like, and again, it's, it's messaging. This is what happens if you lead the regime. But it's no different, do you remember, and I, Teddy, I take your point about history, um, in the 1920s and 30s, Russia went through a number of convulsions over, you know, should the revolution go one way or another way? And Trotsky was one of the leaders, had a certain view. Uh, Stalin won. Trotsky was maybe going to be Lenin's successor, but he turned out to have lost to Stalin. So Trotsky goes to where? Mexico. Mexico. Do you remember how he was eliminated? Ice pick to death. The assassin used an ice pick and he lodged it into the skull about an inch and a half. And that's not where the story ends. The guy's in prison for 30 years in Mexico. He's then released to the Soviet Union where he's feted as a hero. And apparently the ice pick is in some case somewhere, you know, this is how we took out Trotsky. So, in a sense, the the tactics and the the approach hasn't changed that much. Now, Putin gets AI. There's a famous uh, quote of his where he says, "You know, whoever succeeds in winning the AI war will, you know, rule the world." Thankfully, Russian AI is not very good so far. Um, and the Americans are probably three to four years ahead of Chinese. Um, so there's hope, but it's, it's gonna be a tough slog. Thank you very much. Uh, we've gone past four. I think you, you said you would stay for a few minutes. Yeah, well, I, Josh, yeah. I have so to. Have if to people chat. have questions that we want to ask you, they can certainly do that, but I don't want to keep people on the Friday afternoon.
the hub of things to do. So I just want to thank you on behalf of NIMCA. And um, yeah, it's been really interesting to have you here. And I think we should all be reading the book. Getting back to you. Later on. Yeah.